ready to turn towards the Word. Uh, if you do have your Bible, go ahead and open up. We're going to go to John chapter 13. And as I mentioned last week, uh, John 13 to John 17, really John the Apostle who wrote the Gospel of John, of course, in, in accord with the Holy Spirit, really, really, really slows down and spent some significant time, what is called in the upper room discourse. So we are leaning in with the disciples to hear what Jesus would say right before uh, he is to be and would be crucified. And I don't know about you, but I think it is a mercy of God to know that your death is going to be soon. Now, I know some people will say, man, I don't want to know, but I have been around people, many people actually, who were told that they only have a small amount of time, a small amount of time to live. And my dad was one, other people in this congregation that they were saying you only have around three months. They can't tell specifically or they have, you know, this is the, probably the final week or perhaps their final days before they stop breathing here and start breathing in heaven. And knowing when your date will come, and all of us, by the way, unless the Lord comes again, of course, we will have a date. And those who find out beforehand, hey, it's a serious condition or you have limited time, often it's startling, especially if you're a younger person. And I've had um, people in my life who have had that. And so... Getting or given that knowledge that your days are short, you only have a few days left, I do think it's a mercy. And this is why. Because when you have less of anything, you actually become more intentional about how you use that thing. For instance, if you only have $10 to your name, you don't flivorously go and spend the money. If you only have two hours to get your assignment done, you become laser-focused to get it done by midnight. Also, if you recognize that you only have perhaps a few months, a few weeks, or a few days left to live, it gives you a laser focus to really help you think about what's most important. How should I now best spend my energy, my time, my words? And so as I have walked with people during this time, and perhaps many of you, if not most of you, have done that with others, we become clear about what we need to say. What we want to say. And I encourage people when they get this diagnosis to, hey, write down anything that you want to say. Call people that perhaps you haven't talked to in decades. Make sure you explain to your children, if they have them, or your grandchildren, what your heart is. And so, really, that time between a diagnosis or knowledge that your days are numbered and to that day in which you go home to glory, that is a mercy of God. We see Jesus now in that same corridor. He knew that his time was coming, and we'll see him say, now is the hour. What would Jesus say? What was most on his heart? What would be important for his disciples. Now the crowds that are gone, and again, his 12 disciples and perhaps others were gathered near him, and he communicated to them what was critical for them to know as committed followers. It's important for us then, as we turn again to these chapters, to draw close, to pay special attention attention. Because these things were written to the disciples, but they are written for us, right? And so the prayer is this morning, and I pray often for us as a congregation, that God would give us ears to hear. Because God is speaking all of the time. Not just from this platform, but in many places, in many times, by His Spirit. 
So the question is not, is God speaking? But the question is, are we listening, right? So that's the prayer today. And I don't know what the Lord would be speaking to you. Perhaps he already has done through, through our choir or through a greeting out in the parking lot or through the worship. That's a good thing. But God, help us to hear what he would say to us. So this morning, we're listening in to this small circle of committed followers who had been with Christ for years, who've seen his miracles, saw his interactions, were with him, and now the hour was eminent. So this is the context in which we read today, and God help us to see Christ. And we'll see in this passage this morning, our servant Lord, that's the title of this message, our servant Lord, Jesus, the Son of God, who has power over all things, and is in this passage, and the highest position in all creation, this man loved us to the end, led us and leads us as a servant, cleanses us with his righteousness resulting in our forgiveness, and teaches us by example, and tells us to do the same. Important, profound, intimate passage. This, and we can continue as we go forward through the book of John, reading, comprehending, slowing down, hopefully understanding, appreciating, growing in our faith, growing in our commitment, growing in our devotion, growing in our understanding of Christ. That is the goal as we come together every Sunday during the week to participate, to see Christ and become more like Him. So the first thing in this passage we see is Jesus loves us to the end. Okay, again, this is John chapter 13. I'm going to start in verse 1. We're going to go down to verse 17, reading from the NIV version. That version is right in front of you. If you do not have a Bible with you, go ahead and turn to it there. John 13, starting with verse 1. It says this. Now, it was just before the Passover festival, right? Remember, these crowds have swelled. There's million, if not millions of people in this city. Everyone's looking for Jesus. Everyone's whispering about him. Everyone's wondering what's going to happen. He came in in this great fanfare, and now he has been cloistered away with his disciples. It was just before the Passover festival. Jesus knew that the hour had Come, right? Remember, he told his mom, Mom's not the time. He's told his disciples, Now, not the time. And then he knew, Now is the time. The hour had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father. Don't you like that uh, verbiage, by the way? It wasn't time for him to die and be completely exterminated, right? It was time for him to leave the world and then go to the Father. That gives us assurance as well. The next sentence is a pretty profound sentence. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. Jesus is our faithful friend. He walks with us as a companion. He loves us as a brother. And he walked with his disciples day in and day out. He also walks with you while you are in this world day in and day out. He does not leave you. He does not forsake you. He doesn't run away when it gets tough. He is the good shepherd who lays down his life for the sheep. When his hour came, he didn't say, well, it's been a good time, guys. Good luck, I'm leaving. Right. And he could have. He loved them, and I'm going to expand it. He loves you. I want you to personalize it. Walking with you 
And then the ultimate sacrifice, an example of love. Taking the punishment that was due us on himself. It was interesting to think about this passage and hear all of these is, uh, Israelites were gathered together in Jerusalem. They had been celebrating the Passover since it was established by God with Moses in the Exodus, if you're familiar with the Old Testament. God told his people, the Israelites, at that time to remember, to celebrate not just looking at what God had done, but it was anticipation of what God will do. And in that, if you're familiar, if you're not familiar, they took a spotless lamb and it was killed. And the blood of that lamb was placed literally over the doorpost of their dwelling place. So that when the angel of the Lord saw the blood, they would pass over that house, not bring judgment to that house. And there was judgment that came to houses. This was in Egypt, right? Those who did not place their trust in the Lamb, right? This pointed towards the final Lamb, the Lamb who takes away the sin of the world. Thank you, John the Baptist. Behold the Lamb of God. So as they were in Jerusalem at that time celebrating this, the Lamb of God was with them. The once forever Lamb. That's why we don't celebrate the Passover any longer in this way because Jesus said it is finished. Want you to remember how deeply you are loved. I want that reality to give you security and comfort and strength. <coughs> Excuse me. I remember before I fully committed my life to Christ, I was desperate to be loved. I was a young man, we moved around a lot, my parents divorced, trying to figure life out, and I just wanted to be loved, so therefore I turned into the chameleon when we moved to a different place and figured out what people wanted, what people liked, and I became that thing in hopes that they would love me, right? That's my issue, perhaps it's yours, but perhaps not. And I remember when I came into Christianity and I understood that I am fully loved right now, it changed me. Right? Now I didn't try to go around to try to get people to love me, right? I went around looking to love others because I already had been fully loved. You are fully loved. Perhaps you're starting or you're looking for love in all the wrong places right now. Right? Come to Christ. He loves you fully and completely. And knows everything about you. You don't have to clean up your act for Christ to love you. You just have to come to him. Here I am. And all of the glory and all of the gory in which we are. Right? Christ loves you now in the world. And he proved it by giving his life for you. Jesus loves you now and he will be with you and meet you and surround you for all eternity. This is significant for you to know. Know it. If you are his child, you are loved by him. You can't do anything that will make him love you more, nor can you do anything that will make you love him, or he will love you less, right?
This is our Christ, the spotless Lamb who loves us to the end. The next thing we see in this passage is that Jesus leads us as a servant. So we're going to read 2 through 5. I'm going to point out a few things in this passage that is intentional and specific for us to know. So here we go, verse 2. The evening meal was in progress. Okay, this is the Passover supper. These things happened by intentionality. It was happening. And the devil had already prompted Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, to betray Jesus. Now, verse 3. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power and that he had come from God and was returning to God. So he got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing, and wrapped a towel around his waist. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that was wrapped around him. Okay, what is happening right here, right? This isn't something that we do, right? If someone, you came to someone's house these days, and they said, uh, just a second, and they told you to take off your, your shoes and your socks and started to wash your feet, that would be weird, right? Like super weird. I'd be like, okay, it might be time for me to go right now, right? In our day, this is weird, right? In their day, it was a common practice. Well, why was that? Now, there's a photo of the feet, right? Well, let's think about it. <clears throat> One, they didn't have nice shoes and nice socks, right, that took away all the dirt and the dust and the ground. They didn't have any of that, right? It was like leather. If they had shoes, thin, put on there, just took some leather straps and kind of wrapped it around and did it so these would stay on the bottom of the feet. Second, they didn't have nice concrete or asphalt to walk around in, nice, you know, dust-free, you know, mud-free trails to walk on. It was dirt, right? They didn't have cars to drive in, right? None of that. So 99% of the time or 95% of the time, they were walking, right? And then maybe if they're rich, they had a horse, but they're still dusty and dirty. They were in an arid culture, in an arid climate. It was hot, so they were probably sweating, right? So you have the mixture of sweat and dirt and dust and animal leftovers on the ground, right? And you're, you know what I'm saying? You can kind of picture it's like going a long day at the beach, right? And your feet are just kind of nasty, right? And you kind of got to clean them off before you go inside. That's the picture, right? And so it was common that when you entered someone's home, that the, uh, the um, owner of the home, whatever, would have somebody their duty and job was to wash feet, right? They'd say, go on and get over here, wash feet, dry them, okay? And this was thought of really menial labor, right? It was usually the lowest person that was, that, that was their job to do this service for everybody else. I found this quote, and I have it in your notes. I'm going to read it. This kind of describes this. I thought it was helpful. <clears throat> Some rabbis during that time, these are religious teachers, taught that the task of washing feet was so lowly and demeaning that it was even unacceptable to have a Jew do it, even if he was a slave. Now, even today in the Middle East, and right, this is interesting for us to note, feet are considered filthy and undignified. You may have seen scenes from political protests in the past. I've seen them where angry mobs pound statues or billboards with shoes, right? That's what's going on here. Or you might recall the Iraqi journalist who threw his shoes at a visiting president. I remember that, right? This is considered a profound insult. There's a deep sense, culturally speaking, of disgust about feet. <laughs> so here they were, right? These disciples gathered around whatever table or whatever it was set up to be, gathered around, 
And they've probably been there for a little while because the text says the meal was in progress, right? It wasn't as they arrived. There's, uh, John is putting this there importantly. I want you to know it's been a little while, right? This meal had been in progress. And here were the guys with nasty feet, right? Nobody got up to do the dirty work. Right? Maybe they're all looking around. Maybe they're trying to ignore it, right? Maybe they're thinking, hmm, is there someone around here that's going to wash our feet? Right? And it wasn't, by the way, because there was lack of water or a basin or a towel. More than likely, it was probably sitting right there by the door in plain view of everybody, right? And they were just eating along or having their conversation or what have you. It was in that context, right? Oh, that's right. And Judas was there. Judas, who was prompted by the devil himself to betray. This friend was present. And Jesus knew exactly who was going to betray him. He knew exactly what was going to take place because it was prophesied in Scripture. And Jesus knew the Scripture. And he knew who was going to betray him. And then added to that description of Judas being present, there was Jesus, and it says, who had all power. Did you recognize that? Did you realize this? So here's the one who has all power over the universe, all power over creation, all power over everyone. Here's the one that was the sought out, the strongest, who had all power. You see the high point in which John says, hey, Pay attention to this, the low point of who was there, and then the shocker. Right? Jesus then slips away, takes out the, uh, the outer robe, puts on the garb of a servant, and starts washing feet. I don't know what it was like, but I imagine these guys, as they were seeing him do this, there was a a hush, maybe a little shame. And Margie was right when she pointed out that uh, Matthew and Luke talks about that the disciples were bickering who was the greatest among them. <laughs> hey, Jesus, when you come in your kingdom, hey, can I have a throne right next to yours? And here's the one who literally had all power starting to wash feet. If I was there, well, one, I probably I would have been one of the disciples for sure. Right? I ain't doing that. <laughs> if I were Jesus, if I was even doing it, I'd say, Peter, you know, John, Matthew, okay, Jesus. I mean, excuse me, Judas, I'll skip you. <laughs> go. You notice that nobody knew who was going to betray him. We're going to read that, which means that Jesus washed everybody's feet, including Judas. Do you love your enemies, by the way? Very quiet, as it should be. Do you actually serve them? By the way, do you know that Jesus said, he commanded us, we are to love our enemies. That's a command. Jesus didn't say it. I want you guys to do that, but I'm going to skip out. He did it humbly as a servant. Now, Jesus could have just said a word and obliterated Judas. He could have done that, right? All things hold together in Christ, right? Or atoms that are hold, held together in your very body right now are done so because of the will of God, not just physics, God is a God of physics, by the way. That was his idea. Right? Jesus could have said, mm, be gone. But he didn't. <laughs> this is a shocker. 
This says that the one who has all power chooses to serve with it. Do we not long for people who are in power to use their power to serve other people? We know it's a violation deep in our hearts when someone in position and power abuses it to take advantage and hurt other people. Jesus never does that. Ever. And it's a violation of the heart of God when that takes place. And it takes place in this planet. More than likely it has taken place to you as a victim at some point. This is not Jesus. This is not God. Bent down, cleaned the feet as a servant, using his power, expressing the heart of the Father to serve people, even to death on the cross. Jesus is a leader worth following. You say amen right there. He's worth following. He is worth giving your life for. It is, he is worthy of your praise to your um, submission to your dedication to giving your life to him. He is worthy of that because of who he is. You do not have to be afraid of following Christ. He has your best interest in heart. That does not mean that it's always easy. We can say amen. But it's always good and it will always be worthwhile. So when he tells us to do something in Scripture, it is better for us to do it. Do you understand this? This is Jesus, the heart of our supreme, powerful God, serving us, leading us as a servant. This is our servant king, and he is worthy of praise. So this is what Jesus did. He didn't do a display of power. He's like, hey guys, let me show you what else I can do. So in this time that we have together, going to serve you. Next point is this, as we read, and now we get in some continued significant theological um, points here. Jesus washes us, made it first person, with forgiveness. He can do that because he's the authority. He can do that because he's the righteous one, but he watch, washes us with forgiveness. So again, going back to the scene, here are the disciples, here's Jesus with a basin and a towel, wiping the grime and the dirt and the smelliness off of the part of the body that was deemed as being mm, filthy, right? Doing this. Then he came to Simon Peter, this is verse 6, who said to him, Lord, you're not going to wash my feet. I'm not surprised this was Peter, right? Emotional, passionate, outspoken, like some of you here probably, <laughs> like me for sure, right, at times. It's like, Lord, you're not going to wash my feet. <laughs> Jesus replied, I'm sure looking at him square in the eye, you do not realize now what I'm doing. Later, you'll understand. No. No. Said Peter, ah, have you ever told God what he should do? <laughs> yeah, you know exactly what I'm talking about. <laughs> no, you shouldn't. No, you're not. No, I won't. Well, you obviously should have done that. What were you thinking, God? What are we thinking? Who do you think you are? <laughs> Bless Peter, right? <laughs> no, <laughs> said Peter, you shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered, and this is like profound, unless I wash you, 
You have no part with me. Peter all of a sudden changes his mind. (laughs) Then Lord, Peter replied, don't just wash my feet, but my hands and my head as well. Peter was all in. Now, notice what Jesus then said to that response. Verse 10, Jesus answered, those who have had a bath need only to wash their feet. Their whole body is clean. You are clean, though not every one of you. For he knew who was going to betray him. And that was why he said, not every one of you was clean. Okay. So there's some theological um, truth here. Okay. Jesus was serving them. And he said that you are clean. Now, was he just talking about them being physically clean? No. Because having a part with Jesus means you have to believe in Jesus. In order to believe in Jesus and be with Jesus, you must be forgiven of your trespass, right? Or your sin. Jesus says, you have believed in me, and because you have believed in me, you have been Cleansed of your sin. This is a theological term called justification. Have you heard of that term? Right? This is a one-time decision. Right? You realize that Jesus is the Lord, the Son of God, and that you are subject to the wrath of God. Do you because of your sinfulness, your imperfect moral choices? And all of us, by the way, have fallen short of God's glory. In recognition of who he is and his invitation to us, we look to ourselves and like, oh, I need to be washed. I am dirty. And we come to him and he says, you are clean. And so we're washed. We are justified at the point of decision. Now, do Christians sin? I'm glad you know that. Well, what's that about? Right? So when we come to Christ, we are justified by our decision and what he did for us. Our salvation is based upon what Christ did, not on what you do. Okay? Hear me. It's belief in him. You will never be good enough to merit heaven. Right? You may be good, but you're not God good. Right? But because we believe in Christ, put our faith in him, He makes us new, gives us a new heart, gives us a new mind. Well, we're in a process of getting our mind renewed, okay, according to Scripture. And he gives us a new ability to choose to follow him, right? But until we are glorified, we're in this process called sanctified or sanctification. This is a process of becoming more like Christ. If you're a Christian, you're in that process right now. Does Dave Spooner still sin? Yeah, I wish I didn't. Sins of commission, things I choose to do, and things of omission, the good I choose not to do. Well, am I not a Christian? No, I am a Christian. I believe in Christ. I've been washed by him. But my feet now have become dirty, right? You understand this? Walking in the muck of this world. So does Dave Spooner confess his sins to Christ? I do. God, forgive me of my rotten attitude. Forgive me of what I thought about that cat. (laughs) I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I love them, I love them. Don't ask me where that came from. Cats are on the mind today. So we confess our sins, right? According to John, 1 John chapter one, and he is what? Faithful and just to forgive us our sins, and here's the word, wash or cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Okay. So if you sin, do you mean that you, does that mean you lose your salvation? Thank you. My pastor heart is very happy about that response. <laughs> Don't. You already believe the basis of your salvation is not the merit. However, 
we got some dirty feet. <laughs> we need to ask for forgiveness. We need to look to make it right. Not discounting that. And recognition that God is still conforming us into the image of his son, which is the ultimate goal of God, is Christ's likeness in you. Hear me. This is Romans chapter 8, verses 27, 28, 29. Right? And so this is what Jesus is conveying. Saying, hey, you're clean, right? You believe in me. But what I'm doing here is, in my humility, I am forgiving you yet again. Right? This is a theological lesson that Peter is getting and we are seeing as we're experiencing what is taking place there. But he says, not every one of you. And so if someone asks for forgiveness of their sins but haven't put their faith in Christ, they're still not in Christ. Do you understand that? To be a Christian means you have to believe in Jesus. And you have non-Christians who will ask, say they're sorry that I did that wrong. Does that mean that they're going heaven? Jesus is the gate and you only get in through him. Jesus is the only one that paid the penalty for your sin. And by the way, the only one that was resurrected. The only one that promises to return. The only one who continues to speak to us by his spirit. Continue to work miracles in our life. Changing our hearts and doing things that only God does. Jesus washes us with forgiveness. Understand the theological truth that was being um, communicated in this action. What he was doing, showing God's heart, showing theological truth of what he has done, what he has or is doing. It's important for us to know this. So after teaching this to Peter, to us, then Jesus explains how we are to live in relationship to one another by following his example. Next point, final point. Jesus teaches us by example. Doesn't just tell us what to do, but shows us what to do. John chapter 13 Starting in verse 12, so after this had transpired, after this happened, when he had finished washing their feet, verse 12, Jesus put on his clothes and returned to his place. He asked them a question. Do you understand what I've done for you? He asked them. He said also, now you call me teacher, and you call me Lord, and rightly so. And by the way, this is another claim of divinity. He says, I am the Lord. I am your teacher. And when you call me teacher, when you call me Lord, it's right for you to do that because that's who I am, right? Establishing again his position over them and his position over us. He is over us because he's greater than us and he is before us. So in establishing that, then he turns now in verse 14. (coughs) Excuse me. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. They're probably shocked by that. Yeah. Well, that was just for the disciples. <laughs> Are you a disciple? You better be. It's for you and me as well. We'll talk about this for a little bit, what this means. You should wash one another's feet. That's not easy. Verse 15. I've set you an example. Here it is again. That you should do as I have done for you. Not asking us to do anything that he himself has not yet done. Verse 16. Very truly I tell you, no servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. (laughs) 
Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you know them. Oh, wait, that wasn't right. Where does the blessing come? Oh, you do them. <laughs> Here's my 80s kid coming out. <laughs> Knowing is half the battle, G.I. Joe. Do you want to remember that? I know I'm a, I look a lot older than I am. <laughs> you got to know that's half the battle. The blessing, blessing isn't in the knowing. The blessing is in the going, right? The blessing is in the doing. Okay. So let's think about this, right? So here's Jesus, the one who holds all power. He holds the highest position. He's both teacher and he's Lord. Right? He confirmed his identity and told them, hey, you should do this as well. Don't think you're too good to do this for other people. Right? So no servant or no student is greater than their master. If I do this and you say, well, I ain't doing that, you're saying that you're greater than Jesus, and you got an issue. Know what that's called? Pride. Arrogance. I've seen people who have gone overboard with their personal esteem, right? Now, granted, is there an issue of having low self-esteem, low value of yourself? Surely, right? Some of us struggle with that. I had a major issue with that. Right? God's helped me. We want to have a right evaluation of ourselves. So we don't want to have, go too, too low thinking that, you know, no one loves me. God doesn't love me. You know, I might as well eat dirt or whatever that is. Right? We want to be healthy. The other ditch that we can fall in is thinking we're better than everybody else. Right? We have a massive um, self-esteem movement in which our society wants to elevate Everyone to a godlike status, right? That's a problem as well. well I ain't going to do that, right? Well, what does that mean in our, our day and age? What does it mean to wash feet? Should we all have basins and towels at our homes? That's just weird, okay? Well, what, what does this look like, right? Well, this means things around the home like well, it's not my job to wash the dishes. Hmm. Hit a couple buttons there. <laughs> or do the or take the trash out. Or clean up after the cat. There it is again. <laughs> I do love people who love cats. Let me make that clear. I do. I do. Cats can be cool. But you understand, clean up the stuff, right? You guys got dogs, you understand? Or wipe the baby's bottom? <laughs> it's not my job. Or, you know, walking at your office or your school, well, the janitor will pick that up. Or around the church, well, it's not my job to pick up that. Think about this. We have people around this church who are highly educated, have great power, we have doctors and all the rest here. Sometimes when I go out and I park usually down there, <coughs> kids' rooms are down there, I see some of our doctors, high powerful people, taking out the trash, serving in the nursery helping people with mobility issues, meeting with those who have a hard time with their language, don't understand stuff, going to places where people struggle financially and emotionally and mentally and relationally, serving. I'm not sure what washing feet looks like for you. I want you to ask God about that. 
It may be to your, um, your spouse. It might be to your kids. It might be to your parents. It might be the Judas who sits in the cubicle next to you. Wash their feet. Why? Because Jesus washes our feet. Because Jesus asks us to do this as I have done for you. And he was telling his disciples, hey, I'm going to go. You're going to represent me. This is what I want you to do with this position, your power, your influence. Wash people's feet. Take the lowest position. (laughs) This is why we love Philippians, and I'll end with this. No, I won't end with this. (laughs) Be my first conclusion, and I'll do my second conclusion. (laughs) And after that, I'll do my third. (laughs) Look at my notes. (laughs) Philippians chapter (laughs) 2. I love this passage. It describes Jesus, right? We're just, I just got it up here. Um, this is to all of us. This is not easy. We need God's help. Have the same mi- mindset as Christ Jesus. Okay, think this way. Who being in very nature God, right, highest place, did not consider equality with the Father something to be used to his own advantage. His position, his authority, his pristine glory. Rather, verse 7, he made himself nothing. By taking the very nature of a servant, not just serving people, but becoming a servant, and there's a difference. Being made in human likeness and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. And you continue to read that, therefore God exalted him. Powerful passage. We are then to follow in his footsteps. Now, you're not going to die for the sins of other people. That's not what I'm talking about. You're not qualified. But we can die daily in a sense of serving other people for the glory of Christ. Do you hear this? It's good for you to do this, and it's beneficial for others to receive this. Do you understand that? Right? You start getting too big on your own self, go clean a toilet. I have a pastor friend who actually does this. A pretty famous dude, right? He starts hearing all this acclaim, all this stuff. He's like, you know, it's time for me to go clean toilets. And he literally cleans toilets. Because it's good for him. It's good for you and it's good for others. And it honors Christ. And it is worth it. John Piper says this quote. This is a great quote. He says, you will find that the deepest joys in life are not when people are hailing you in your status but when they're helped by you in your service. That's good. You will find that the deepest joys in life, right? and I hope you're looking for deep joy. I hope you desire that. I do. Don't try to get this joy by people singing you happy birthday, right? But when... Uh, uh, let's see, you find that the deepest joys in life are not when people are hailing you in your status, but when they are helped by you in your service. I want you to be super joyful. (laughs) And the way to finding joy is to go down. That's where you found it. The more you serve in this way, the greater your joy will be. Go and do likewise, you will be blessed if you do them. I want you to be the blessed, most blessed people on the planet. Don't just wait by your mailbox for a check to come in. Go serve somebody. Do you hear me? Then you'll be blessed. Go find somebody to serve. And serve them, and you'll get more and more blessing. The more you serve, the more you're blessed. So let's get busy. Stop thinking too much of yourself, but think more of Christ and follow him. Our great high priest. So I'm totally now coming in for conclusion. (laughs) Glad you're here. So we're going to pray, and we're going to sing. 
And we're going to eat purple cupcakes if you want some. But don't let this morning be lost on you, okay? I want you to think about it, right? Really think about this. Really think about this, what this means for you. And then look to apply it this afternoon when you go and serve junior hires at public school, right? When you go and <laughs> help people with their dogs and cats, right? Whatever you're doing, I, I don't know. You know, God knows. Let's live this way and honor Christ because he's worthy of the glory. So I'm going to pray. We're going to sing. So God, here we are gathered. God, you're here with us. We leaned in with the disciples today, God, as you know. I'm so grateful to have this window into what you did there, what you said there. And God, as you know, we're going to continue to look into this. Again, give us ears to hear. And God, I know you spoke today in various ways to us. God, I ask that that thing that now is in our mind would move to be in our heart. And then... Help us to choose to live that out. And God, we need your grace and help and mercy to do that. Jesus, thank you for loving us to the end. <laughs> thank you for using your position and your power to serve us. God, thank you for telling us and teaching us to follow you and inviting us to do what you're doing. And God, I ask that there would be great blessing this week because we listen to you. Great blessing this month, great blessing whatever time we have left, God, until we see you, Jesus, face to face. Do that in us, God. Encourage us, strengthen us. Lord, thank you for your help and for your mercy. We give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen.